and welcome to today's webinar presentation, Building a Real-Time Analytics Stack with Apache Kafka and Apache Druid, brought to you by Implied Data. And with that, I would like to pass it over to Rob Meyer. Morning, afternoon, and, ev and evening, everyone. Can you hear me? I'm going to assume yes. So uh, just so you know a little bit about Imply, it was started by the creators of Apache Druid out of a company called Metamarkets a long time ago. Uh, since then, uh, the technology was turned into open source, became a top-level Apache Software Foundation project as Apache Druid. And uh, the founders, the creators went on to create Imply as a company. It's been funded since then by Andreessen Horowitz and Coastal Ventures, and more recently also by Geodesic. And outside of the thousands of companies that use Druid, uh, hundreds of applications have been deployed uh, using Imply, using the, the software and the people that Imply has wrapped around and built on top of Druid. And the business has been booming. So uh, Imply continues to invest heavily into Druid, and that's really what we're going to talk about today. Uh, today's speaker is uh, informally known as the Merlin behind Druid. Uh, Gian Merlino is right now the PMC chair and one of the key committers to Apache Druid. He continues to do it. It's what makes him happy, so that's good. And uh, he frequently speaks on various topics around Druid, especially as some of the newer features come out. And uh, today, after uh, much demand, uh, from fans, uh, we decided it was important to talk about one of the most common combinations of technologies with Druid, and that's Kafka and Druid, because that's really what it was designed for in part. So for those of you who don't know Apache Druid, I apologize if uh, this is too repetitive and you all do, but basically it, uh, it at this point is the leading open source or ASF version of a real-time analytics database out there. People usually know it because it's fresh. It can ingest millions of events per second um, at millisecond level latency, meaning you see it as it comes in. You see it in queries as the data is on the Kafka or Kinesis bus. It's uh, got a full breadth of analytics that people use in operations. So uh, that evolved out of the, um, really out of uh, the original use case in meta markets and others in ad tech that they needed a combination of time series and ad hoc and search and other things like alerting to be effective in operations. And then it was it was built for, for speed. It, it, people always had the need for speed here. So if you benchmark it against other uh, analytics technologies, it's an order of magnitude greater than, than pretty much anything else out there. It's used by thousands today. It's spread out of ad tech a long time ago into other uh, businesses. A lot of people have adopted Druid at scale. There are Druid deployments with millions of messages a second um, at scale that do not go down. You're probably touching it. You just don't know it yet. But if you're watching Netflix or you're watching Game of Thrones or you're watching Disney Plus, there are a whole bunch of deployments that are relying on, uh, on Druid under the covers. So what uh, Gion and others have added to Druid is more around uh, hardening it, making it fully supported, adding monitoring and management and security. This is the same core Druid. Uh, nothing really has changed in the core between what Imply delivers and what Druid is. But on top of the core abilities, uh, advanced security features and monitoring and cloud management, there's a whole bunch that goes into real-time alerting and visualization and making analytics super simple and intelligent. So uh, helping people understand the data so they can make decisions more easily. There's also Druid as a service. There's Imply Cloud for those that don't want to deploy it. And there are a whole bunch of people uh, in support and services to uh, help uh, people get up and running and get the best practices implemented up front with Druid. Uh, so there are hundreds of applications out there. But at this point, I, I want to hand it over to Gian so we can get to the meat of the presentation, which is what you're all here for, which is uh, using Kafka and Druid together. So Gian, take it away. All right. Thanks a lot, Rob. 
Um, did you want to open with any questions or are we going to hand? No, we're going to save right. the hardest for last at the end. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Um, so, uh, hey everybody, uh, like, like Rob said, I'm, I'm Gian Merlino. I'm, I'm one of the folks working on Druid. What I wanted to start with first though, is talk about what's the problem that exists in our space. And, and I'm really going to talk about Kafka and the ecosystem a bit before I talk about Druid because, uh, the real, the real message I'm hoping to get across is, is how Druid fits into the bigger picture. And so I got to talk about the bigger picture first, of course. So that being said, what is the problem we're trying to solve? The problem we're trying to solve is we want to do real-time analytics. That's why, that's why we're all here. Um, but what does that mean? How do we do it? And how do we, how do we think about it? And uh, importantly, how has the way that we've thought about it changed over the last few years? Because there has actually been quite a bit of change in the way that people are building real-time analytics systems over the last um, even four or five years. So um, the problem is that we want something we want something like this. We want a user interface where people can uh, see real-time data, interact with it, explore it. This user interface is Imply Pivot. It's an application built by Imply that runs on Druid. Um, but the general concept of a real-time dashboard is something that's, that's incredibly popular and, and that I, I bet a large percentage of you have some kind of real-time dashboard already. What we're trying to do is we're trying to power these real-time dashboards. We're trying to make them as fast as possible. We're trying to make them as interactive as possible. We're trying to make them on, as, uh, on top of as many data sets as possible. Where do we start? Um, so let's start simple. Let's, let's start simple and let's build up a architecture from scratch. Um, I think that's, that's a nice way to talk about it. So the way that we're going to start in building our architecture is the very, very simplest thing. We have Kafka. We have an application. Um, and the application might be a shopping cart app, uh, might be a, a server for a mobile game, you know, whatever it is. Um, there's an application, we have Kafka, we're gonna directly produce data into it. Um, so we're using the Kafka producer SDK in our application. Um, uh, those of you that have used Kafka, there's a library that you can just write data directly into it. And we'll write one message per checkout, we'll write one message per user click, you know, you know whatever. And then we have data in Kafka. Um, we can't actually do anything with it yet, but we got data there, so that's step one. Um, other ways of getting data into Kafka, uh, we might not write directly from our application. We, our application might use a transactional database. It might use something like MySQL or MongoDB. Um, and then, so the application is talking to the transactional database through a database library. Um, and then we may load data from that transactional database into Kafka using something database specific. This is called change data capture. Uh, it's, a, it's just a fancy term for getting a stream of changes out of a transactional database into some other system, in this case, Kafka. Another great way of getting data into Kafka. Still not doing anything with it, but you know we're getting there. Um, okay, so what are we gonna do with Kafka? What are we gonna do with that data? Um, the simplest thing we can do is we can just take it out of Kafka and put it somewhere else. So the simplest thing is we can put it into an enterprise data warehouse, we can put it into a data lake, uh, and, and I would call this a streaming data pipeline. So we have data coming in from an app or a change data capture, and then it goes into Kafka, it doesn't stay there for very long, it immediately gets written out somewhere else. Um, and this is, this is okay, it's, um, it's not necessarily the most uh, groundbreaking usage of Kafka. Um, but it is where a lot of people start. Uh, when I've, I've seen people deploy Kafka, I see a great many people start by just loading data in and then immediately writing out to a data lake. It, it, is, it is a good starting point. It's not really real-time analytics though. Um, and at this point, we've done the easy thing. So, and, and we're not really sure where to go next. So we go to Google and we type in real-time analytics and we see what, is, what does Google tell us real-time analytics is all about? Okay, so I type top real-time analytics tools and um, Google gives me this helpful snippet that says Kinesis, Cloud Dataflow, Azure Stream Analytics, Apache Storm, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what, what are these things? Uh, and, there's, and there's a lot of others of them too. There's a, a Apache Spark Streaming, Apache Samza, um, Kafka Streams. Um, uh, there's, there seems to be a ton of them under the Apache umbrella. Every public cloud vendor has something like this. What, what are they? They're stream processors. Um, they're things that, that sit on top of data, uh, that sit on top of Kafka or, or some other message bus like uh, Google's version or Amazon's version or, or what have you. Um, but they sit on top of a message uh, system like Kafka uh, and then they do stuff with data coming off of it. And, and what can you do with these things? Um, 
Well, the simplest thing you can do with a stream processor with all these tools like, like Spark Streaming and Flink and whatnot, the simplest thing you can do is you can just take real-time actions. So now we're actually getting real-time. We're not really doing analytics yet, but we're, we're doing a real-time thing. We're not just dumping data into a data lake. We're actually taking action in real-time. So let's say you want to send an API call or an alert whenever there is a, um, you know, whenever there is a uh, error rate uh, above a certain percent or whenever something bad happens in your application. So your application is sending data to Kafka, your stream processor is looking at it, and then in real time is able to send out alerts or make API calls to other systems. So we've actually built something real time now. This is pretty cool. Um, it's still not really analytics, but, but we're getting there. Um, okay, what else can we do? We can actually take a we can take a step in a different direction, and we can do the same thing we did with the with the data pipeline. We can just use a stream processor to write data into Data Lake, into Enterprise Data Warehouse. Um, they're actually pretty flexible and are able to do a lot of the uh, of those um, you know data movement oriented tasks as well. You're not really doing anything fancy, just moving data from one place to the other, but um, but they can do it. Um, what else can they do? Uh, they can also do uh, what I would call a continuous query, and now it's starting to get interesting. Now we're starting to actually use them to modify data and transform data. Um, and this this ability they have to transform and modify data is really the foundation of of how we're going to use them to build an analytical stack. Um, so uh, this continuous query, um, you might think of it as enrichment, um, and so they can do both enrichment and data movement. Um, and this enrichment might be joining two streams. Um, it might be adding geolocation data to an existing stream. Um, you know, it might be doing anything like that. Um, okay, cool. So we're still not really doing analytics, uh, but we're getting we're getting closer and closer. So we're moving data, we're enriching data, we're starting to build some building blocks. Um, what do we do next? So uh, if you look at what the stream processors uh, are generally doing, uh, what they're generally recommending as far as how you do analytics with them, a lot of them will suggest that you use the stream processor to write data to a key value store. Some of them, the fancier ones, even have built-in key value stores. Um, but whether you're writing to an external key value store like HBase or Cassandra or Redis, or whether you're using a built-in key value store that some of them have, um, there's a key value store and you have an application that reads from it. Um, and uh, now we're actually getting, we're getting a bit closer. So you can imagine this key value store, you can imagine storing um, keys and values in the store representing how many products are sold for a given product line on a certain day or a certain hour. Um, you can imagine storing, uh, using the, the processor to compute top products sold on a per day basis uh, broken down by region. And so you can imagine using the processor to, to compute all these uh, aggregates and compute all this information, store it in a key value store, and then use an application to visualize it. Um, and because you're computing this stuff continuously, using continuous queries, um, you're moving that data into a key value store, an application can query it. You're actually getting the ability to have a real-time dashboard with aggregate analytical information updated in real time. So this is, uh, we, what we've done here is we've put together, um, we've put together the kind of, uh, of analytical system, a, a real-time analytical system that you would typically build on top of, of stream processors like, like the ones we've seen, like Spark Streaming, like Flink, um, et cetera. Um, some of them, not all of them, support uh, the ability to take it one step further and do what I would call direct state access. So direct state access, like I said, some of them have a built-in key value store. Um, direct state access is when the application accesses state directly out of the stream processor. That's useful when, you know, let's think back to that example where you are computing the top 10 products by product line or by region, let's say on a per hour basis. Um, and then writing them into a key value store. Now, one of the problems with that is you don't know what the top 10 are until the hour is over. So a classic uh, approach might be to wait until the end of the hour, then write to the key value store, or maybe write an update to the key value store every five minutes with the most recent information. But that's not really real time. And so sometimes the desire to aggregate data inside your stream processor conflicts with the desire for real time. Um, and so the way that some of these, these guys solve it is allowing the application to directly access state inside the stream processor that hasn't been written to a key value store yet. Um, and, and this bridges that gap uh, between you know, the, the, aggregation, um, the aggregation window and real time, allowing their stuff you build on top of this kind of system to be truly real time. 
but it's getting pretty complicated. It's getting complicated. The application needs to access two different backends. It's got to access the key value store. It's got to do direct state access. Um, these APIs are not the friendliest APIs. They are very tied to the kind of application that you're building. Um, so if you have keys for you know, products sold broken down by time or top products by whatever, um, this, this schema that you have is very specific to the kind of dashboard you're building. You probably need to set up a separate stream processing job for every dashboard. You need to code every dashboard individually. Um, you don't get a lot of reuse. You don't get to use off the shelf business intelligence tools. Um, so it, it, it's a system that works, but the development effort is pretty high. It's pretty inflexible. Um, and we've kind of painted ourselves into a corner because um, these key value stores are not good at doing uh, their own analytics internally. We've kind of pushed everything into the stream processor. Um, so uh, with that said, uh, the Druid approach is to kind of think about this a little bit differently. The Druid approach is rather than pushing all the analytics into the stream processor and having a, a dumb storage system that's just coughing them up and having to, to model that data in ways that are very tied to the application that you're building. The Druid way of doing things is to put the actual data, raw data, or maybe lightly processed or, or somewhat moderately pre-processed or pre-aggregated into Druid, um, and then have an application to sit on top of that. And Druid speaks SQL. So you can put uh, traditional business intelligence applications on top of Druid like Tableau and like Looker and, and Superset and things like that. You can build your own application using SQL, um, which is nice because it's a commonly known language, uh, very flexible as well. Um, and also that implied pivot app that I showed you earlier runs on top of Druid. So the, the idea is that rather than embed a lot of logic about the exact way your dashboard looks, rather than having to build a key value schema based on the app you wanna make, you load your data into Druid and then you can build apps on it. They're a bit more decoupled the development cost is lower and the system is more flexible. Um, so in order to make this possible, uh, you still want a way to enrich data. You still need a way to do stream joins. You still need a way to you know, attach that GUIP data. It's still best to do that before the data goes into the analytical database, Druid, um, just for performance reasons. So it's still best to do that with something like a stream processor. So it's not like, it's not like they don't have a place. Um, they, they do have a strong place in this world, and that, that, place is, um, that place is enriching data, preparing data to be loaded into a database. You do then a continuous load of data from Kafka into Druid. Um, and in Druid, the aggregation and serving layers are merged. Instead of having a separate system where, you know, on the previous slide, instead of separating the aggregation layer into a stream processor and the serving layer into a state store or key value store, uh, in the Druid world, um, this aggregation and serving layers are put together. And that's what gives you the power and flexibility. So the, the core idea is um, the core idea is use a, use a analytical database that has this kind of power. Um, internally, actually, uh, interestingly enough, or um, the Druid architecture actually looks a little bit like that that classic real-time analytics architecture where things are separated. But um, internally, it looks like that, but it hides a lot of that complexity from you and it hides it in a way that allows it to become more powerful as well. So that internally what Druid's doing is you're loading files, you're loading streams, they go into something called an indexer. So Druid's got a, a, a process called an indexer, Druid's got a process called historical processes. So the indexer handles real-time data uh, or data that's been written generally over the last hour or so. The historical processes handle older data. There's a handoff process where data is compressed, optimized, indexed. That's why it's called the indexer handed off to historicals. So in most clusters, in most Druid clusters, you know, 95% uh, of your data is gonna be on the historicals and then a little bit's gonna be on the indexers, the real-time data. And queries will hit both. Um, so this concept of being able to hit uh, both, uh, you know, permanent long-term storage, uh, which in the, in the classic architecture is a key value store and hitting a direct state um, that hasn't been put into permanent storage yet which in the classic architecture is the state store of your stream processor. In Druid, that's the indexer and the historical, but it's all, it's all um, handled by Druid itself. Users, you, developers, just hit one Druid server called the query broker. You issue SQL queries to it, and then it will figure out, okay, I need to get this bit of data from the indexer, this bit of data from historicals. It'll stitch it all together, and you don't have to worry about it. Um, so by it, that's the mechanism by which it um, reduces the amount of dev effort you need to put in to get your apps built. 
So I think let's ask a couple of questions right now because yeah. I'm not getting a lot of questions yet. And I'm curious how familiar people are with the different technologies. So Drew, if we can push the first question. Absolutely. So okay. uh, first, how many of you know Kafka and how well do you know it? So if you could select one of the following, you're not familiar, you're familiar with it or evaluated it, you're actually using it right now and developing or you're in production. If you could check one, that'd be great. Okay. So All right. Here's the uh, from what I see here, a little over 80% are familiar in some way and uh, a third are developing in production. About a half of you are figuring out what to do with it. So good. So pretty familiar with Kafka. Let's put push the next question about Druid. So same question, just for Druid. How familiar are you with it? Okay. All right. So you're starting the stream, but not starting to uh, analyze the data or process it with analytics. So about 4% uh, of you are actually developing. So looking forward to those questions for people developing, uh, either you're asking some here or you're asking some in the Druid uh, Slack channel or somewhere else, but we'll, we'll be very curious to hear what you are thinking. Great, let's go on for a couple more slides. We'll ask another question or two later. All right, and then, uh, okay, where is, let me go back into the full screen. Mm -hmm. Um, as you can see that. Okay, so um, and and what are the what are the challenges? So I was talking about the Druid architecture. Um, there's a lot of challenges involved here. You know why um, why is Druid one of the few things that can do this? What is what is hard about solving these problems? Um, well, the first one is scale. The first challenge is that when data is large, we need a lot of servers. Um, and it is is tough to make a distributed system that can do this kind of work on uh, very large amounts of servers. At at Imply, our some of the largest customer installations that we're supporting are over a thousand servers, uh, serving billions upon billions of rows of data. Um, speed. So speed's important. We're aiming for sub second response time. You saw those graphics I was showing earlier. We really want a real time dashboard. Um, we don't want to build something that's scalable and can handle a ton of data. But then, you know, like systems like Hadoop and Hive, they can handle a lot of data, but the queries take so long. They take 15, 20, 30 minutes. So it's it's not something you can power a dashboard off of. We want sub-second. Um, and then complexity is another challenge. Complexity, there's too much fine grain to pre-compute. You know, I was talking about that classic architecture where you um, use a stream processor and you uh, <coughs> <clears throat> fill data into a key value store, and then you power your application off that. That gets you real time. It gets you scale and speed, but it doesn't get you able to handle complexity because you're pre-computing so much stuff. Um, and the kinds of queries that users are going to want to do, you don't want to have to predict all of them. You want to give them flexibility to make queries you haven't thought of, uh, which means you don't want to be pre-computing aggregate information. You want to um, essentially give them the ability to scan the raw data very quickly. So high dimensionality. That's really what drives the complexity, tens or hundreds of dimensions. So think about a web analytics data set. Um, you've got so many dimensions. You've got a uh, browser, you've got platform, you've got geolocation information. Um, you've got information about the user's demographics if they're logged in. Um, you know, this can quickly add up to 30, 40, 50 things that you want to be able to slice and dice on. And that's really what's driving all that complexity. Um, and then finally, concurrency. Uh, so you have many users, many tenants, um, and you want them all to be able to coexist together. And it, it is challenging to build a system that, that allows that. So the key Druid features really speak to these challenges. When we set out to design Druid and build Druid, um, we knew it had to support high concurrency. We knew it had to be scalable to hundreds of servers. And like I mentioned, we've actually been able to scale it to thousands of servers um, since the original build and millions of messages per second coming in. Um, so being able to scale to even very high levels of data coming in from Kafka. Um, we knew we had to support continuous real-time ingest from Kafka, and we do support that. Um, we also support uh, ingest from other message systems like Kinesis. Um, we knew we needed to be able to query through SQL. 
Uh, that's important for a lot of reasons. It's important for developer familiarity when you're building a real-time application or dashboard. Uh, we want people to be able to query the database with SQL and not some, you know, not some custom language that they need to learn. Um, and also for integration with off-the-shelf tools. So off-the-shelf business intelligence applications will work with Druid. Um, we knew we needed to support sub-second query latency on billions of rows. Um, the, uh, Rob mentioned that um, the initial use case for Druid was at a company called Meta Markets that was built around uh, digital advertising, and, and digital advertising is a market where there is a, really a ton of data. Um, so it had to support that scale from day one. And we have to avoid pre-computation because pre-computation is the enemy of, um, it's the enemy of being able to handle that, that highly complex data. Um, finally, I wanna talk a little bit about the deployment pattern. So this is the typical way that people would deploy Druid and Kafka together. Uh, you have an event stream coming in um, up to millions of events per second coming into Kafka. You have some kind of enrichment happening typically. Uh, not everyone does this. Some people don't need enrichment, but a lot of use cases do require enrichment. And by enrichment, of course, I mean joining stream, enhancing data, adding fields, that kind of stuff. You use tools like Flink or Sparkstream for that. Um, and then you're loading that enriched data into Druid and then you're using Druid to power your applications. And so you would power, you'd run notebooks on Druid, build um, scalable applications on Druid, run implied pivot, run off the shelf business intelligence apps. Um, and uh, okay, so now I have some time to decide for a demo. Yeah. Uh, Rob, do you think it's a good time for a demo? Or do you think we should do some more questions? No, no, let's, uh, why don't you set up for the demo? I'm gonna push a couple more poll questions out. I see the questions coming in, so we're good. Okay. Um, so Drew, why don't we push out the next question while, uh, while Jan's setting up the demo? Absolutely. Yeah, so now that we've talked about uh, Druid and Kafka, just taking a step back, what kinds of analytics do you, are you thinking about doing or, or planning on doing uh, on all the data that's coming through Kafka? Are you trying to do alerting and monitoring or real-time dashboards? Are you trying to do some time-based analysis, some ad hoc slicing, dicing, some search, or you don't need any analytics, you're just building apps? Okay. Great. So it's not surprisingly a pretty big mix of the three type or four types of analytics. A lot of alerting and dashboards is the most common, which we see a lot of that in operations. A lot of time-based, not surprising since time is money. Um, good slicing and dicing and, and search, 40% are search. And I think that's one of the reasons Druid evolved the way it did, that it added all those things because that's what people are trying to use. So should we save another poll for later? Or you want to do the other one now and see what people say? What's the last one again? Uh, the last one is speed. It's all about how fast does it need to be. So maybe we just push it and see. Yeah, sure. Let's, Let's push that. the last one. Okay. And the final poll for today's Great. presentation. So this, this is all about the need for speed. So how fast, how live does the data need to be or fresh? And how fast should the queries be? So do you need the live data within a second? Do you need the results within five seconds or within 10 seconds or within a minute? Or you really don't care because there's a lot of historical analytics or reporting going on. It's not yet real time for the business. And here are your results. Yeah. So. Uh, on the one hand, internal facing applications, we see it going within 10 seconds. That's generally okay. Sometimes we see longer for the latency. People can are okay with 30 minute latency on some kind of apps. But the second it's hitting a customer, we usually see that it has to perform within a second. The latency of the data, it could be five seconds old, but the query has to be sub second every time or they start losing customers. So interesting results, but over a third need it within a second. Great, thanks Drew. Okay, so um, I am gonna go through a quick demo uh, and then I think after that we'll take some questions. So um, what I, I'm in my terminal right now, that's where all the magic starts. Um, I'm just gonna start by starting up. I've, I've already taken the liberty of downloading the implied distribution of Druid 
which comes with Apache Druid plus imply pivot. And I'm, I'm going to start that up. So there's a, a one command startup. Um, we have a quick start configuration that we come with that starts all the components. Um, and I've also downloaded Kafka, uh, the most recent release, and um, I'm going to start that up as well. Um, let's see. All right, so there we go. There's Kafka started up. I've created a topic called Wikipedia. And um, what I want to do is I want to load in some of this data set over here. I've got a data set. Um, I've got a data set that represents edits made to Wikipedia. So it's a data set that comes uh, from the Wikipedia organization itself. Um, and it's every line here is a JSON document that represents one edit that's been made to a particular page by a particular user, et cetera. Um, we use it for a lot of our demos because it's a really nice publicly available data set. So, okay, so let's um, let's first load a little bit of it into Kafka. So I'm going to use the Kafka console producer, um, and I've just got my broker on localhost, topic Wikipedia, and I'm going to load this data file. This data file is not too long. It's, it's a few tens of thousands of records. Okay, I've loaded it in. Um, I also, in this other tab, have a console consumer running. So, so let me just clear that out. Um, I can run that, and then we can load this data again. And when I load it, it'll show up in the console consumer. So at least now I know the Kafka is working. Let's move on to Druid. Um, OK. So in Druid, there's two ways of interacting with it. We can use API, or we can use uh, the web console, web UI. I'm going to use the web application because it's a lot easier to use. So OK. Um, this is the Apache Druid web console. Uh, when you open it up, you see first off uh, status, what extensions you've got loaded, what version, information about data sources, information about running ingestion tasks, information about what processes are running, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'm going to uh, go to load data. Um, so we have a nice little loading data flow. Uh, we support a variety of things you can load from. The grayed out options are options that I don't currently have extensions loaded for. So you know, you saw on that earlier screen what extensions were loaded. I can load a Kinesis extension, S3 extension, and then I would have those options available. In this particular setup, I've got the Kafka extension loaded, so I can load from Kafka. Okay. Quick question that was in here. Um, someone using Protobuf in production with Kafka. Yes. So that just works fine, right? Uh, yeah, so we support, um, I think, uh, a bunch of text-based formats, uh, Protobuf, Avro, Thrift, and it's all based on an extension system, so you just got to make sure to load the right extensions, and most of them come out of the box. Some of them are separate downloads. Great. So, okay, I'm going to click Kafka, click Connect Data. It um, uh, looks like what we saw earlier was about 80% of you all are familiar with Kafka. So you know that when you have a Kafka consumer, you need to specify a bootstrap server and a topic. So I'm going to do that. Localhost 9092, the default port for Kafka. And my topic was Wikipedia, the one that I created earlier. Um, and it's actually going to sample a little bit of data uh, to enable me to create a schema. So I'm going to sample from the start of the stream because this is actually not a stream that's receiving any real-time data. You see, I'm just producing into it using the command line. So if I chose end of stream, um, it would not actually find anything. So I'm going to do start of stream, click apply. Here's what it found. Okay, so it found all, it found a bunch of data. That's great. Um, click next, parse the data. Uh, it detected that it looks like it's in JSON format, which is correct. Um, if it detected it incorrectly, I could always change the format to one of these ones that's supported with the extensions I have loaded. So out of the box with no extensions, JSON, CSV, TSV, and then regular expression for parsing log files. Um, and then in this setup, I've got two extensions loaded for binary data, Parquet and ORC. But JSON, it got it right, so I'm going to move on. Um, uh, when on the next screen, um, I'm parsing a timestamp. So everything in Druid is time oriented. Uh, our aggregations are, you know, are time oriented. Our partitioning is time oriented. Um, we support optimizations for time filters, time-based retention. Time is a very important concept in Druid. So uh, Druid needs to know which of your columns is the primary time column. 
Um, that's the one that will be used for things like retention and, and fast time filtering. It's okay if you have more than one time column, um, but you do have to pick one as your primary. Uh, in this case, I only have one, so and it's been detected. So I'm just going to go with the one that's detected. It's called timestamp, um, and it's in the standard ISO format. Um, if it wasn't in that format, I could pick different ones. Maybe it's a number. Maybe it's one of these formats, and I can also just type one in. Um, okay, so the next step is transform. I'm going to skip this, but the, the purpose of the transform uh, ability is to do some light uh, transformation on ingestion into the database. The idea is what if you just want to apply a regex, a simple string replacement, make something uppercase or lowercase, it would be wasteful to require you to use a stream processor just for that, something like Spark Streaming just to do that. Um, so Druid can actually do that on ingestion. It can do simple transformations like that. We only want you to have to use a stream processor to pre-process the data if you're doing something really fancy. But I'll skip this. Filtering, same thing. Druid can filter out some data if you have more than you actually want to load in, um, but I'll skip that as well. Okay, so now I'm configuring a schema. Um, so Druid's detected the input types. Um, it's detected that various of them are going to be string, um, some will be numbers. One very interesting thing here is this rollup button. So rollup is a feature in Druid that I won't get too into right now, but um, I encourage you all to read about it in the documentation. It's very helpful for real-time analytics. The idea is that um, if you, there's two ways to store data. One is you can store data raw, so you one row in the database for one input row, um, and that gives you the most flexibility, uh, or you can store it rolled up. And if you store data rolled up, the idea is you pick and choose beforehand um, which columns you want to be able to filter and group on and which columns you want to be able to aggregate on and we'll support any combination of the filter and grouping columns, the dimensions. So there's no limitation on which ones you can combine, as, um, but we will do a partial aggregation along those and that can save a lot of space. So that's an option. Um, in this case, I'm gonna turn it off. So I'm not gonna roll up. I'm just gonna store the data raw. So I've turned that off. Um, and so now you notice that this uh, added column, this comment length column, these were things that used to be were formerly modeled as aggregations. Now they're just modeled as simple um, integer columns. Okay, let's move on. Um, the next thing I can do is configure my partitioning. Like I mentioned earlier, Druid's always doing a primary partition based on, on time. And that, that time-based partitioning can be by hour, by day, by week, et cetera. If you're loading in a data that spans a very wide range of time, it might be good to choose something like month or year. Um, I'm only, you know, I'm going to be loading in data that is um, an hour at a time, so I'm going to choose hour. Finally, tuning. Generally, most uh, use cases are not going to need to change any of these, um, and you can just sort of continue on, but they're here in case you need to change any tuning parameters, and they all have little help screens if you want to see what they mean. Um, the only one that you really have to, to choose an option for is use earliest offset. Do you want to load from the beginning of the stream or the end? I'm just going to say false, so I'm going to start loading from the end of the stream, which means that when I um, start this, it's actually not going to have anything to load until I produce more data, so I'll, I'll go and produce more data. Um, <coughs> all right, so that, that whole data loading flow produced this um, JSON document. This JSON document that we call an ingestion spec. It's a specification that tells Druid how to load data from a particular data source. So in this case, we're loading data from Kafka, this topic, uh, this schema, um, this input format, JSON. So it's, it's, you can also write these by hand. And when I said earlier that Druid supports either API or the UI, um, if you're using the API, then um, you would just write this by hand or you would generate it programmatically and submit it to an API endpoint. Let's just, let's submit this here. Okay, so it's submitted, um, it's pending, it's not doing anything, and that's because um, I have it reading from the end of the stream and I haven't actually produced any data yet, so let me go do that. Okay, we're back here. Um, produce more data. Boom, okay. So now let's go back here. Um, and we can see that now it's running, no longer pending. Um, it has uh, started to load this data. Um, and there's one task over here. I can kind of see statistical information about um, what's going on here. Uh, I can see how much data has been loaded in the last um, one minute. It's loaded 300 messages. Last five minutes, the 76 messages, et cetera. So I can see statistics about loading, how many messages are thrown away, how many are unparsable, how many are processed with error, et cetera, et cetera. 
I can also query it. So um, you can see that uh, this is Druid's uh, query view. Um, there is only one table available right now. Uh, move this little thingy so I can just. There's only one table available right now, Wikipedia, the one we just loaded. Um, I can do select count star from Wikipedia. And it's going to have as many rows as my data file had, a little over 24,000. Um, and then there's also all these other queries. I mean, there's also other columns I can do. So I can, you know, let's say show channel. Um, I'm going to get rid of this time filter. So here's all the channels, uh, English Wikipedia, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's a Wikipedia for every language and how many records are for each one. So I can run these SQL queries. And actually the web console supports a really interesting um, feature where you can uh, click around in the console, change sort order, and it'll actually change the query for you. Okay, so um, that's cool. Uh, I can also visualize it. So this is built, this is all the function I built in the Druid. This is part of Apache Druid. Um, you get it as part of the implied download, but it's part of Apache Druid. There is also um, implied pivot, which is part of the uh, implied download and is um, and is uh, not part of the Apache download. So this is this is implied pivot that Apo was showing a video earlier. Um, it is built around this data cube concept, which is something that has dimensions and measures. If you're familiar with um, business intelligence lingo, then that would be familiar to you. So I'll create one for Wikipedia. I can go to it. Um, this supports a lot of customizations. It supports the ability to create dashboards. So you can make real-time dashboards with this. I'm just going to do the very most basics here, um, the explore mode. So in the explore mode, um, what do you see when you first open it up and don't do any customization? You can just drag stuff in. Um, and this, uh, you can see this, this uh, channel information here is the same stuff I was seeing in SQL. Um, but I'm kind of doing it in a, I'm, I'm doing it in a visual way, which is kind of nice. Um, I can nest things so I can see for each channel, what are the top pages, meaning you know, for each um, Wikipedia uh, zone, which are the top pages. So here's the top ones in English and, and so on and so forth. Um, so two different ways to query it, visually, uh, visually and with SQL. Um, and of course, you can also build your own applications uh, using the SQL interface and you can connect off the shelf third party BI apps as well. That's it for my demo. Oh, great. Um, and uh, maybe now we can uh, move on to some questions. Let's go see some questions. So, um, uh, one question which was interesting was uh, someone who's been using uh, BigQuery. How does the loading experience, uh, loading data into BigQuery compare contrast to loading into Druid via Kafka? And, um, you know, how is it that you, you know, if you had to think about loading into Kafka and what considerations you have for how you transform and enrich the data, how's that different from BigQuery? Yeah, so I think that the batch loading experience of Druid and of BigQuery is somewhat similar. In, in both cases, you're connecting to data that's going to be in cloud storage, usually, or something like that. Um, they they both have a way to, you know, define a schema and ingest data. Um, the stream data experience loading from Kafka on, on Druid, the nice thing about it is the integration is very, very tightly integrated with Kafka. So you can see that you connect directly to Kafka, you, you connect directly to your Kafka brokers. There's no need for middleware that moves data. Um, there's no need for any sort of connection SDK. Uh, and that, that tight integration means also that Druid can offer you monitoring on, on Kafka specific things, like how um, far behind you are in your offsets, where you are on each partition. So Druid speaks the Kafka lingo. Um, and it's it's a, a little bit of a nicer user experience. Okay, I'm going to ask a follow-up question to this because I hear this a lot. Um, how do you deal with exactly once? Ah. Because it's actually different in BigQuery than it is in Kafka as well. So that is a difference. Yeah, good question. So um, exactly once is a very interesting topic. We actually have a whole uh, blog post um, on the implied blog about uh, how we do exactly once. If you search for... Um, I believe the keywords are uh, farewell Lambda architectures. Uh, um, Lambda architectures, of course, being the the sort of hack that people developed to get around the fact that that systems circa mid 2010s didn't support exactly once very well. Yeah. Um, but the way that the way that we do it, uh, the 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 hinging trick is that of course Kafka has offsets um, that allow you to track precisely where you are in the Kafka stream. Um, Kafka now. Uh, as of recent version, supports transactional topics. Um, so on the Kafka producer side, exactly once is supported. And on the consumer side, what Druid's doing 
is Druid is tightly correlating the offsets from Kafka with the um, data ingested into Druid. So um, I, I threw around the word segments a couple times. I didn't get into detail what they are, but a Druid segment is essentially just a, a block of data, a few million rows um, that's ingested into Druid. Uh, and every segment ingested into Druid is associated with certain Kafka offsets. Um, and so we track them very precisely. And if there's ever a failure or something that we need to recover from, um, we can restore to the exact point that we left off and thereby get exactly one suggestion. Okay. Um, how do you handle uh, Kafka failures or Druid failures? How does that work between the two? Any tips and tricks for that? Yeah, so um, a lot of it's automatic, which is the nice thing about these, these um, sort of Apache big data systems that were designed for us. Uh, so in Kafka, as long as you don't lose all the brokers for a particular partition, um, it'll generally be able to recover automatically, which is great. Um, and on the Druid side, as long as Kafka is up, Druid can recover. Um, uh, one of the features of Druid is that it persists data long-term um, on what we call deep storage, which is generally going to be something like S3 or HDFS or Google Cloud Storage. Mm -hmm. um, we're able to restore from that. So even if the entire Druid cluster fails, we can restore um, your data from deep storage and we can restore your checkpoints and we can pick up exactly where we left off in Kafka. So Druid has actually um, got, an, a, I think, a very uh, powerful fault tolerant design in that it, it is resilient to a failure of even the entire cluster. Mm -hmm. I saw this a few times. There's one question about Grafana, Kibana, and Elk. There's another one of, can you give an example of search using Druid? So maybe you can give an example or um, uh, talk through search capabilities. Yeah, so um, one thing we, we say about Druid is that it, it sort of draws from these different worlds, these data warehouse world and search world. Um, the, the thing that we draw from the search world is uh, the concept of inverted indices and the way that we do indexes. So the way that, that Druid, um, I'm still sharing my screen, so let me show an example here. If I'm doing a, a filter, a country name, United States, um, the way that we resolve this filter is very similar to how a search engine would do a search. Uh, so what we do is we have an index where all the potential values, all the, we have a term index essentially, um, where all the potential values uh, have a compressed bitmap that relates to what rows match that value. Um, and we are able to then skip to those rows rapidly. Um, and that, that index-based filtering is, um, is something that gives you uh, performance as close to a search engine mm -hmm. for um, for drilling into stuff and doing drill downs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a couple questions about dashboards here um, and data. The first question was around, can you snapshot data? I think I need to ask that as, um, can you uh, go back in time and review data from different periods in Druid? I think that the question around snapshotting is, um, is data ephemeral or not, and can I reproduce it? And you and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I'll watch the questions, but um, I think there's a whole conversation about how do you uh, how do you store and manage data and and review things from different time periods. I think that's really the question because Druid isn't really about snapshotting a particular point in time. You're actually building a real time version of the data warehouse, so you can always go back and see the the results from a different time period, right? Yeah, so I would say that the way to think about Druid is that you are um, loading a stream of facts into it, you're, you're loading a stream of data into it, and then we're going to store those uh, as long as your retention policy dictates. Mm -hmm. So uh, out of the box, there is no defined retention policy other than store everything. So out of the box, it'll store everything you ever give it. Um, you can then define retention policy if you wish and say store you know, 90 days, one year, whatever. Um, and the the idea is that uh, we want querying old data to be just as fast as querying new data, and so that's why we've got the design that we have. Um, and uh, I guess another another interesting thing related to that to those capabilities are um, if you want to, you can always because of this deep storage capability, um, storing data. You know the fact that we have a backing store on S3 or HDFS or what have you, um, you can actually unload data from Druid and then reload it later. Um, uh, as long as you haven't deleted it from your deep storage. So that could be like a snapshot, um, kind of. 
uh, it depends on what you're, I, I guess, I guess I'm not 100% clear on, on what um, the intent of, of the word snapshot was. It but, could be a backup or it could yeah. be just capturing a certain point in time. But hopefully, hopefully that discussion of, of capabilities is useful to whoever asked that. Okay. And then for scheduling of reports, does it take a, a static snapshot of the data there for the reports? Um, so Druid itself, uh, Apache Druid doesn't do any sort of, it doesn't support any sort of scheduled queries. Right. Um, it's, uh, you know, you really should think of it as um, kind of like a database where you issue a SQL query, you get a response. Yeah. Um, on the imply side, part of the imply stack uh, does include a scheduled reports feature. Um, and the scheduled report feature, the scheduled report feature on the imply side works by, you know, essentially issuing the same query on a regular basis and then sending the reports to you by email or whatever. Yep. Quick question: Can you connect to cubes from Excel? Ah, can you connect to cubes from Excel? Um, so the data cube concept on the imply side is is a pivot concept. Um, the uh, let's see. Um, you can connect via SQL. You can connect via SQL. Yeah. I know that 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 Excel I think has limited support for connecting through SQL. I, I believe that through ODBC drivers, Excel can connect to SQL databases. Right. Unfortunately, I, I, I'm not 100% sure on this. I think that that may involve um, pulling out a, a large amount of data and slicing it in Excel. Yeah. So that might not be very scalable. Yeah. Um, so you might you might run the challenge of scalability due to the design of, of how Excel does yeah. interface with SQL. Yeah, I have seen people doing it. I think they create specific cubes for it as well. Yeah, uh, I was just talking to someone who does it. Um, a quick question about uh, read performance. When the data is skewed on the time window and historical data is very much skewed, um, I guess it's a, more of a general question about read performance over time periods. Yeah, so read performance and data is skewed on time window. I guess um, that can mean a couple things. Uh, you know, maybe maybe it means that certain time periods have much more data than others. You know, maybe uh, holidays have. If you're doing a retail thing, maybe like a, you know Black Friday has a lot of uh, more data than other days, um, or it could mean that uh, it could mean that you know there's skew across some other dimension. Like you know maybe you have again retail example, maybe certain stores uh, or certain products have much more data than others. Um, uh, I would in, in both of those cases we have tools to handle that. In both of those cases, the way that that you know I, I talk about the, the way Druid does partitioning. Um, and I, I showed in the demo that you can select hour, day, et cetera. Um, what I glossed over was the fact that there's also secondary partitioning within the primary time partition. And so even within the hour, um, you know, the ideal partition size for a Druid segment is a few million rows. So let's say you have 100 million rows per hour. Um, well, you're probably going to have about 20 segments within that hour. And then they're going to be partitioned uh, by a secondary method. And the secondary method is going to be something that's designed to, to eliminate that skew. So each one is about the same size. Um, I, hope, I hope that answers the question. I think so. But the, uh, the, the, the idea is, is both primary and secondary partitioning to address skew. OK. Uh, question about cloud. Um, any um, running Druid in any cloud provider on-prem or in a hybrid model. Uh, I guess I, I'd say uh, I'll start it off with uh, there is Druid as a service. There's Imply Cloud, and, and we host that. And uh, that's probably half of our customers are running Imply Cloud. And then the other half are running it as a cloud, meaning uh, a mix of AWS, Azure, and GCP. And if they're not running it there, they're running it as their own private cloud on their own infrastructure. But it pretty much the thing that in interested me as I came on board, pretty much everybody's running it in a cloud configuration using Docker and Kubernetes or something like that. There, people don't think of it as a non-cloud deployment. I don't know what your answer would be there. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think that I think that the way I would the way I would gloss that is that you know, even if you're deploying on-prem, um, you know, Druid at its heart is designed to be something run in an elastic environment. So the Druid servers are designed to make it so you can scale up and scale down just by adding processes and terminating processes. It's, it's sort of designed to be elastic. Um, and so even when you're running in bare metal, it kind of feels like you're running in a cloud environment because no server is really special. Okay. How, um, it, 
Any uh, good sizing or tuning recommendations? And maybe there's some reference links at the end we can go to. Yeah, I, I think I actually might not have a reference link for that specifically. Okay. But if you go to the Jura documentation, there's a um, there's this a, a, a I think we call it a basic tuning guide, and um, there's much more detail there than I could I could get into in this in this uh, uh, venue. But um, I would I would say please check that out. Okay. And can we run Confluent Cloud and uh, Druid as a service or imply cloud together? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, that's uh, that's probably one of the easiest ways to get this thing set up. Yep. All right. Well, uh, Gian, thanks. I think we have one more uh, piece to mention. There is the Druid Summit happening April 13th to 15th for those of you who are really curious we're giving you a code and giving you 50 percent off so feel free to register for that it's going to be april 13th to 15th right near sfo uh near the airport if you're flying in or if you're nearby you just drive on down so uh best case we see you there worst case we see you uh online next time so Jean, i want to thank you so much for doing this uh there are lots of good questions folks if we didn't get to your questions feel free to go to the Druid Slack channel and just start asking away on everything Druid and uh, someone's gonna step up in the community and answer it. Yeah, if you go to if the you go to druid.apache.org and then click community, you'll find links there to Slack, mailing list, GitHub, all the places where the Druid uh, team is uh, able to talk to you. Yep, so we're looking forward to seeing you there or at the summit, but uh, hopefully see you soon. Thank you. Okay. And with that, I would like to thank Rob and Jan for a great presentation. I would also like to thank Implied Data for providing the audience with a great webinar. Lastly, thank you to everyone who attended today. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career. Have a great day.